Well, good morning, church, and welcome to our time together. What a great joy it is uh, to open God's Word and to, to see Christ in all the pages of Scripture and to enjoy Jesus as a, as a family today. I want to ask you where you're at to grab your Bible and open up with me to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Uh, I want to tell you a, a brief story. Uh, you know, six, seven years ago, uh, my wife and I uh, got married and we moved in together. And when we moved in, uh, we did not have cable and we also did not have the internet. And so when it came to watching TV, uh, we had to rely on our DVD collection. And to be honest, we didn't have a lot of DVDs. Uh, so we watched the same movies over and over again, a few different TV series over and over again. And eventually we kind of exhausted uh, the, the majority of our collection. And I was searching through uh, her DVDs one day and noticed that she had the final three seasons of the TV series Lost. And I told her, I said, hey, you know, we haven't watched this. Why don't we, you know, watch these uh, final three seasons of the show Lost? And, and she told me very quickly, well, I don't have any of the beginning seasons. And you know, if, if we start with what I've got, you're going to kind of jump into the middle of it. And it's not going to make any sense to you. And she was right. <laughs> uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with that TV series, it's, it's wild. There's, 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 there's people living on an island, and the island itself can move. Um, there, are, there are people who are dead who are still alive. Uh, there's time travel. Uh, there's a variety of casts and a variety of characters. And I kind of just jumped in and said, hey, let's just go for it. And it did not take very long for me to have everything mixed up and everything confused because I didn't look at the, the, the beginning of the story. I just kind of jumped into the middle of it and I was lost, uh, pun intended. Next week, uh, next week, we're going to begin looking at the commands that God gives his people. And they're going to start with a very famous uh, text of scripture, the, the Ten Commandments. And before we get there, I want you to, to, to understand and for us to get that it is it is very dangerous for us to pluck those commands out of the biblical context that they're in and just kind of hold them out on their own. Right? If, if we just take the Ten Commandments uh, then, then, and that's where we start, then we miss the storyline. Right? We miss the context that they sit in. And because we miss the context that they sit in, we kind of miss the picture. We kind of miss the point of what God's doing with his people by providing them with gracious, good, wise instruction. And so knowing that that's on the horizon for next week, uh, what we're looking at today and what we've been looking at through this series uh, really sets up the context that, that provides um, uh, what God's going to do with his people in the, in the giving of the commandments. And so Exodus 19 is a very important chapter that we need to understand in order to truly understand properly and biblically uh, the commandments that God's going to give his people in Exodus chapter 20. So uh, I pray that today is, is fruitful and today is helpful as we look at Exodus 19. Now, as we've walked through the story, we've seen God rescue his people from slavery in Egypt. We've seen God uh, protect them and offer salvation through the blood of the Lamb. We've seen God alter, offer uh, saving grace through the Red Sea narrative. We've seen God provide for their food and for their water. And uh, now God's brought his people uh, to the base of a mountain, Mount Sinai. And at this point, in Exodus 19, God is going to set up the terms for their relationship. And today we're going to primarily uh, look at verses 4, 5, and 6, which uh, are the, the covenant that God's putting forward, the agreement that God's putting forward uh, for his people. And as I said, they will, they will kind of 
set the, the direction and, and help us understand fully the commands that he's going to ultimately uh, bring from that. So let's look at Exodus 19. I like to read verses 1 uh, through verse 8 and then pray and ask Jesus for help as we uh, study. And then we'll uh, begin working our way uh, through, this, through this covenant together. So Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we bless your name and we worship you. You are good and you are holy and you are righteous. And Lord, left to ourselves, we have no right to even approach you. For we all have sinned and we all have gone astray. and We all have turned our backs on you. And we are all deserving of of your eternal wrath and damnation. But by grace alone, you brought our rescue in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the one who is perfectly righteous and who yet died in our place as our substitute. And it is his blood that covers us today and washes us white as snow. And Lord, we know that the grave did not win. From the third day he rose, victorious over our greatest foe and our greatest fear. He is the way and the truth and the life. And I pray, Lord, that we would follow him for his way is good, and his way is right. Help us today. Shape our hearts by your grace. Mold us by your goodness that we would live a life that truly glorifies you and enjoys you every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Covenant. This is an agreement. As we said, God's brought his people uh, to, to the, the base of this mountain, and he is setting up an agreement. He's setting up the terms for their relationship. And we're going to look at those terms today. Uh, we're going to consider five, um, five aspects of, of this text uh, that even extend beyond this text and into the gospel of Jesus Christ, our King. And uh, today's sermon is, uh, is brought to you by the letter R because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use R's uh, for, as my uh, sermon points with alliteration. So, uh, we'll begin with this first R, and that is that the people were rescued by God. They were rescued by God. As we said in verse uh, 4, uh, beginning in verse 3 and carrying into verse 4, uh, God lays out um, this, this covenant with the people of Israel. And we see in verse 4 that his first statement is not uh, what they should do. God's first statement, his initial statement is what he has already done, right? The foundation and the basis 
of the relationship between God and his people is grounded and rooted in him and what he has done for his people. Listen to this, this beautiful language in verse 4. Listen to what God says. He says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. What, what beautiful picture, what, what beautiful language that God says, hey, I rescued you and I lifted you up and then I, I brought you near. And I brought you near. Consider a, a, a child, but perhaps a baby who is, who is in harm's way. And so, you, so we, we, we act upon it. And what do we do? We go over and first we, we, we grab the child, right? We grab it to rescue the child, but then we lift the child up. Right? Lift the child off the ground, out of, out of danger. But even then, we don't just walk around with the kid just holding them up in the air. What do we do next? We, we draw them near. Right? We draw them to our chest. And we hold them tight. This is the picture God gives of how he's rescued his people. He says, I, I came to, to where you were, and I, I picked you up out of, the, out of the Egyptians, and I lifted you up, and I brought you to myself. And you are my rescued people. These are, these are statements of fact. Right? These aren't the do's that the Israelites need to do. These are the done's that God has already done for his people. He's accomplished this. They are a redeemed people. They are a rescued people. And the beginning of this covenant that God's making with his people, it begins with what he has already done for them. When we think about our relationship today with God, we are reminded that it's grounded and rooted on Jesus Christ, our King, the one who has already accomplished everything on our behalf, that, that we bring nothing to the table but sin and wickedness. But he is the one who has rescued us. Jesus is the one who rescued us and he lifted us up and he bore our sins on his cross. He drew us near as he opened our hearts and opened our minds to respond in repentance and, and faith. And because of what Christ has done, we, where we have a new identity. We are, we are a new people. And some of the, the words that, that we've used as a church to think about who we are in Christ, right? That, that first we are a redeemed people. Paul uses this phrase in in Galatians 4, that we have been redeemed by Christ, meaning that we've been bought out of slavery of sin. And we were bought with a price. We were bought with the blood of the sacrificial lamb, the substitutionary lamb, Jesus Christ, our King. Uh, we've been bought, but we're also a forgiven people. As we saw and we walked through Colossians 2, that we have been forgiven by, by, by God through Christ Jesus, the one who who went to the cross on our behalf. To, have you taken hold of that truth that you are forgiven because Jesus paid it all? Not only are we forgiven, we also have the identity of being righteous. We are a, a righteous people because of the given or imputed righteousness of Jesus, that his righteousness has, has covered us, right? As, as Paul says in Philippians 3 says, I don't want to be found in a righteousness of my own, but I want to be found in the righteousness of Christ. That we have been given his righteousness today. We are a declared righteous people by a, by a good and holy God. God says that we are loved. Like Paul says at the end of Romans 8, because of what Christ has done, because there is Therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, united to Christ, that, that there is absolutely nothing that will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, I pray that you would take hold of that truth. There is nothing that will separate God's people from God's love because it's grounded in Jesus Christ and what he has done. Not only are we loved, we go forward, we say, the scripture tells us that we are an adopted people. That not only God declares us righteous as a judge, but he then adopts us into his family. He is our good father. 
and the basis of our relationship, uh, the grounds of our relationship, the foundation of our relationship is Jesus Christ, King Jesus, that he has made us a new people. We are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We can rest in this. Rest upon these truths, church. God begins his covenant with the Israelites in Exodus 19 by saying, know who you are. You've been rescued from Egypt. You've been carried out and, and you've been brought near by my grace and by my goodness. So too, we've been brought near to our God. Now, every person God rescues, he then calls into a new way of life. Right? That there's a new way that we should live. We should not continue in the old way, but we should continue in the new way of, of life. And so as, as we continue in this covenant that we started being, they were rescued by God. Now, verse five, we see, required by God. The Israelites were required to do something. Listen in verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. If you obey my voice. God is being gracious in this moment. God is saying to the Israelites, listen, the way that you were living, you were living in your own wisdom. And guess what? That's no wisdom at all. You know, where did it lead you to? It led you into a lifestyle of corruption, a lifestyle of destruction, a lifestyle of hardship. And, and, and now what I want to do is what God said. What I want to do is I want to show you how to live a good life, a life that walks in wisdom a life that walks in truth. And I want you to trust my voice. I want you to obey me, right? Obey my voice and, 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 and be, be good to this covenant that we're making, this agreement. I, I want you to do these things. We, we really see the wisdom of God in this moment when we step back and consider how God has dealt with the Israelites thus far. Right? If we just go back a little bit, we... We've seen God providing for Israel in physical, tangible ways, right? That they could see, they could experience, right? If we go back to the, to the Passover narrative, they, they witnessed the blood of the lamb and they saw the blood of the lamb over their doorposts and they, they witnessed God going through and they, they heard the cries of the Egyptians but they saw how God passed over their homes, right? This is physical. This is tangible. They could see that. In the Red Sea moment, they, they saw the waters parted, and they walked through on that ground. They felt the ground on their feet. They, God was providing in physical ways. And even when they got to the wilderness, we see God providing for their water and God providing for their food. These are they're, they're tasting his provision. God, just, God has already shown his, his, that he is trustworthy, that he is good, that he knows what's right. And now we see God moving further, moving deeper, saying, listen, now I want you to trust my voice. Now I want you to trust my wisdom. You're not going to necessarily see these things. You're not going to see them in front of you, but you're going to hear them. And I want you to trust me, just like you trusted me when I parted the Red Sea. Just like you trusted me when I passed over the homes. Just as, I, as you trusted me to, to provide food and to provide water. Now I want you to trust my voice. And I want you to follow my way. It's a call for obedience. That God's about to put forward commands. Put forward his gracious instructions to show the Israelites how to live their best life. God rescues, then he requires, he calls his people into this new way of living. And once again, we're reminded that, that we who, are, who have been rescued by Christ are to now live for Christ. That we are to follow his good, gracious, wise way. In John 14, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right? We've not been rescued by Christ to continue living the old life. 
We've been rescued by Christ to engage in the, the new way of life. And we do that today in the, the power of his spirit working in and through his people as we grow and mature in Christ-like character, following him day by day. Now, I want to make a, another brief comment at this point that is, that is important. This is something that we have talked about as a church uh, many times. And that is this. Uh, now, now, stay with me here. These first two, being rescued by God and then required to live this new life, there is an order to those, right? It's that, that you've been saved to now, to next, live this new life. We've been saved, we, we can say, we've been saved by Christ to now live for Christ. Now, that's important. Saved first to then walk in this, this new life of obedience. And the reason that's important is because it affects our motives for obedience. Right? When we, when we forget that order, what naturally happens is it reverses. And we begin to think the way I live determines how I'm saved. Right? So I better do good things. I better be obedient in order to gain God's love. Or I better be obedient to the commands so that I'll be accepted by God. I better work hard and do good things in order to work my way and earn my way into heaven and into God's grace. And when that becomes uh, the mindset, which is false, that we're, we're working and we're living obedient lives in order to gain salvation, our motives for being obedient are being obedient can be improper, right? We, we begin to be obedient out of fear, like fear that I'm going to miss out on something else. Or our motive becomes barter. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live this certain way so that God will give me this certain thing, right? God does want his people to be obedient, but he also wants our heart motives to be right. In order for us to have that proper heart motive, that biblical heart motive in our obedience, we must keep the order right to understand that we have been saved by Christ, fully, freely, eternally saved, to then live for Christ. It's, it's because God, Jesus has done everything and that we are loved by God and accepted by God that we then live this new way of life in obedience. And when we understand that Jesus has accomplished everything, our obedience comes from a place of gratitude. A, a place of thanksgiving, a place of love for him. Like, I love you, Sai. You've done so much. I love, I love you so much. I want to follow you. Keeping these things in order. God rescues, and then he leads his people in a new way of life. May we continually remember this. Jesus has accomplished it all. Our works participate in no way to our salvation because Jesus' work paid it all. God sets up this covenant with the Israelites and I've rescued you. Now, I want you to live this new way. Now, there is an important word in the covenant. In verse 5, there's a very important word. Did you catch it? It was the word if. If you will obey my voice and keep the covenant, then these things are going to happen. Now, I'm going to come back to that word in just a moment. But needless to say... They're going to fail. They're not going to do it. Um, but we're going to come back. We're going to just give me a, just a brief moment. We're going to come back to that if because there is one who is going to do it. He's going to do it perfectly. Jesus Christ, our King. But we'll come back. We're going to circle back. Let's, let's move on. I want to continue with the covenant and see this final piece of the covenant. They've been rescued by God. Uh, they are um, required by God. Now, third, they're to represent God. Or they are representatives of God. Look at me in verse 6. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, a priest was someone who, could, who had access to God, who had intimacy with God. And a priest would mediate between God and people. 
And God says in this moment, he says, listen, if, if you'll be obedient and be, become my treasured possession, you're going to be the people who, who display my glory to the nations. And then it's going to be appealing. Like you're going to, sh Israel, you're going to be a kingdom of priests who display what it looks like to live a life trusting in the, the goodness of God, walking in his character, following in his way. You're going to be a display to the nations. And the goal being that the nations would see it and that they would say, man, we, we want to come under the rule and reign of God. Right? I, I know we haven't gotten to the Ten Commandments yet, but I want you to consider this just for a moment. Just consider this. And we'll take just the first ten, just the Ten Commandments. Imagine a community, like a whole town, a large community of people who followed all Ten Commandments perfectly. A community of people who were unified in, in, in trusting and living for the, the one true God of creation. And a community that perfectly worshipped Him in every aspect of their life. And they honored Him and they followed His way and and then they loved people really well. Like they honored their, 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 their authorities. They honored their parents. They, 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 they valued life and they did not murder one another. They, they valued marriage and they did not even look at lust with, with their, somebody else's wife or someone else's husband. They No adultery. They, they, they were trustworthy and they never stole from one another. And they always told the truth. They never lied to one another. It was always true and trustworthy. And they were content with what they had. And they didn't covet their neighbors and possessions and stuff. Like Imagine an entire community of people who perfectly did those things. Now, would you want to live in that community? Like, of course we would. Like, that sounds amazing. That sounds like paradise. It sounds, if we can be biblical, it sounds like the garden in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. It sounds like a people who are truly living their lives trusting God and trusting his wisdom, and they're walking in perfect peace and perfect harmony. Like, that's how God wants his people to live. That's how God wants the Israelites to live. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. And when you're living this life, being obedient to my voice, the other nations are going to see it. And they're going to say, that looks great. We want to, we want to live under the rule and reign of God. He is awesome. And so living this life in obedience to God's voice is also the life of being a missionary and being an ambassador of our God. We too today are called to, to be these ambassadors of Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he, Peter in 1 Peter 2 says that we are a holy, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Picking up on this particular language that, that our lives, that when we, when we live an obedient lifestyle, it is good for us, but it's also a display to our community. It's a display to our neighbors what it looks like to be a people who live under the rule and reign of God. And it is meant to be appealing. It's meant to look good. It's meant to lead others, our neighbors to say, I, I want to live like that. We're missionaries. We're ambassadors. We're representatives of our God. And the goal of this covenant is that Israel will represent him well. And the nations will want what they have in him. Now, at the end of the covenant, as we read uh, just a little while ago, that after God finishes these words, he then uh, sends Moses back to the people, and Moses talks to the Israelites. He says, this is the deal. This is, this is the terms of the agreement. And the Israelites say, we will do all that he has spoken. This is verse 8 of chapter 19. And so Moses tells, tells God, he says, they, they're in. And God gives some final instructions for how the people are to, to consecrate themselves and prepare themselves. And, and we see at the end of chapter 19 that God, his presence comes down to the top of the mountain. And it's, and it's a radical display of his greatness. It's thunder and it's lightning and it's, it's, it's sounds and it's trumpets and it's, it's big and it's bold and the mountain trembles. And we see the power and the majesty of our God. And he's prepared to launch in to what it will look like now. Now that you have said yes to the agreement, I'm going to show you how to live. And 
that's where we're going to pick up next week with our study is God beginning to give the instructions for how his people are to live under his rule and under his reign. Now, I said I want to circle back and what we're doing now. There was an important word. It was the word if. If the people will live this life and they'll obey his voice and they'll do what he calls them to do and they'll trust him and they'll walk in his wisdom, then things are going to go great. But they don't. And they fail miserably. In fact, they're going to fail before this scene ever even ends. They're going to fail miserably. And we'll see later in the narrative how they build a golden calf and are worshiping it as though it rescued them from Egypt. And it just all falls apart. And as we continue to follow the narrative, Israel continues to be rebellious and they continue to break the commands and they continue to be disobedient. And by the end of Moses' life in Deuteronomy, uh, the end of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses is talking to the people and he says, I have no confidence that y'all are going to keep these laws. I have no confidence you're going to keep the commandments. You're going to break every single one of them. And he says, the problem that you have, and the problem that we have, is a heart problem. We need something more than just to know what to do. We need the power to do it. Uh, our hearts are still messed up. And as we walk through the, the narrative of the Old Testament, we see Israel continuing to fail and continuing to fail and continuing to fail. But in the prophets, God begins making these promises right, that I'm going to fix your heart. One is coming who is going to change hearts. I'm going to give you a new heart, a heart that, that walks and, and trusts me. I'm going to write my laws on your heart so that you'll actually participate in them and trust in them and Although Israel failed, one would be perfect. And we see, if I get back to our, our R's, that uh, this covenant finds its perfect fulfillment. It is, it is realized by King Jesus. King Jesus is the one who comes, uh, the Son of God, who enters into creation. He is fully God and he is fully man. And he lives this perfect life that the Israelites were called to live, the life that you and I were called to live. Jesus is the one who truly obeys God's voice perfectly. He's the one who truly keeps the agreement. He's the one who truly walked a sinless life, a blameless life, a perfect life, a good life, a righteous life, a holy life. He never broke any of God's commands. And, you know, often we think of the Ten Commandments. There's actually 613 commandments, and Jesus never broke any. He never broke any, not only physically, but even internally. He never even had a lustful thought after a female. He never even had, a, had a, 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 an angry, sinful thought in his heart. He, he walked in perfect godliness. He did everything that was required of God's people. And he is the one who truly is the treasure of possession. And he truly is the holy nation. And he truly is the kingdom priest. And although he never sinned and he never fell short, in fact, he kept the law perfectly, he ultimately laid down his life as a ransom for all of humanity who are habitual lawbreakers. We our habitual lawbreakers. We have broken these laws over and over again. Israel's going to break the commandments. We have broken the commandments. But Jesus would go to the cross to receive the penalty of sin, which is God's eternal, piercing wrath and damnation. And what should have been put on all of humanity's head, God was willing to put on the head of his son. And Jesus was that substitutionary lamb who died in our place and received the wrath of God in our place. And he was truly dead and laid in the tomb. But the story doesn't end there because a few days later he rose from the grave and he declared victory. He was the new creation. And he told his people, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Don't look to yourself to be able to accomplish 
perfect obedience because you don't have it in you. Your heart is messed up, but I am a heart giver. And when we turn to Jesus, when a person turns to Jesus as the author of their salvation, they say, I can't, but you can. His death, his atoning death, is, is, is accredited that, that our sin has been forgiven. And not only has, has, uh, has our sin been forgiven, but his righteousness is credited to our account. And the righteous life he lived, the perfect life that he lived, the sinless life he lived is given to us. So now God sees us in union with Christ as people who never sinned. Even though we have, even though we do, God still sees us as a people who are sinless because we have union with Christ. And it is his life in our place. And everything that is his is seen as belonging to us. Now, that's not including his deity and not including his authority, but his righteousness and his goodness and what he's done is seen as belonging to his people who look to him. And so now we who have responded in repentance and faith can claim hold that we are God's treasured possession and we are a holy nation and we are a kingdom of priests, not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done. He is the one who has done it. He is the kingdom priest. He is the holy nation. He is the treasured possession. But because we're united with him, his work is seen as, as belonging to us. Union with Christ. I want to I read you a quote uh, uh, briefly, uh, a quote by Dr. Kenneth Keithley. A uh, professor at Southeastern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary, he writes, uh, God declares that whatever our representative, the Lord Jesus Christ, has accomplished, those who trust in him also have achieved. His riches, righteousness, and merit belong to all who are in him. Everything that's Jesus' is now ours because we're united together with Christ through repentance and faith. We all fail at this covenant. Of course, this was for Israel, and they, and they failed at it, and we would fail at it too. But there's one who did it perfectly, Jesus Christ. And he offers his perfect record, his sinless record, his righteousness to anyone and everyone who looks to him for salvation. And so that leads us to our final R for the day, and that is response. We have a response to make in this regard. You have a response to make wherever you're at in this regard. We're either going to look to Christ, look to Jesus and surrender our lives to, to his way, to his rule, to, to lay down our rights and to say, I'll follow you. You're, you're my salvation. Or you're not. And, and make no mistake, no matter where you're at, whoever's watching this, make no mistake that there's a day on the horizon when we will stand before God and we will give an account. And we will either go as people who failed and be left on our own, or we will, be, we will go as people who look to Christ for our victory. There's only, one, there's only one of two choices. There's only one of two routes. It's either in Christ or not. And more than that, uh, the, the, the union with Christ is good for us today. Remember, God wants his people to live a truly good life, a truly great life, their best life. And their best life is not going to be lived on their own. Listen to me, your best life, your greatest life, your most joyful life, your most wonderful life is not going to be lived walking in your own wisdom and walking in your own way. Because we're not wise, and we're, we're prone to wonder and prone to sin. If we want to live our best life, then we'll look to Jesus, and we'll trust that his commands are, in fact, liberating. They liberate us to joy. How will you respond today? I pray that you will look to Jesus and trust in him for your salvation. Let's pray together. Father, we worship you and we praise you. You are good and you are righteous and we are not. We are deserving of nothing less than your eternal judgment. 
Praise be to God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has come and to receive that judgment in our place so that we can receive his peace. Lord, I pray today that we would be a people who, who look to Christ and declare his gospel regularly, that we would trust Jesus in all things and at all times. Lord, I pray for anyone listening, you would stir their heart and stir their affections for Jesus Christ and that they would look to Jesus as their Lord and as their King on this day. Help us to follow Christ well together. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless.